is Behind the Games from NewOverlords.com, where we seek creators of all kinds to find out what's behind our favorite games. With your hosts, Jeff and Seema. This is New Overlords Behind the Games podcast. And from our Midwest studio, I'm Jeff Elamek. And from our Northeast studio, I'm Seema. Today, we're joined by Mikhail and Jess from Folklore Games, where they've been working on a really interesting game called Spiral. Mikhail and Jess, welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I saw Spiral at PAX, and while the art and design were really well done and really caught my eye as I was walking by, when I started talking to Mikhail about hearing about what the story is and what the meaning is behind that, that's what really caught my attention. So today, just so people know, that's what we're going to be diving deep into around what kind of game this is, which is a little bit different than you may have heard about before. And this concept called The Mechanic is the Message, which I think is fascinating and it comes from Brenda Romero and her book, and, but is, is something I've been thinking about for a while myself as well. But let's kick it off with describing the game so we can paint this picture for people. So tell us a little bit about Spiral. Uh, sure, I, I guess I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so Spiral is a narratively driven exploration game that share a poetic vision of cognitive degeneration seen from the inside. So essentially, you're going to uh, accompany Bernard as he relives memories from across his whole life, uh, essentially becoming a witness to, his, to what he lived and try to remember for him as he slowly forgets. So throughout the game, well, at the core of the, the game, there's exploration. It's an exploration game. So you're going to visit those memories, interact with different elements, characters, and try to learn as much as possible uh, from Bernard's past. But at the same time, we also have mechanics that are there to help you connect uh, with him. So, for instance, if his father is teaching him how to fish, you're going to be the one doing the fishing, hiding from his mother when she's trying to, uh, to, to punish him and things like that. So we really want the player to essentially connect with Bernard to help him uh, feel empathy. And we also have the cognitive degeneration that affects the game, but not only visually or in the story. As uh, Jeff said, there's the... It, we, I don't think we, we ever put it that way, but uh, the mechanic is the message is something effectively that, that works, that can be applied with the logic of what we want to do with Spiral. We want the player to understand as much as it's possible to do uh, what Bernard is living through. So we're going to affect every part of the game with that cognitive degeneration. So the UI, the mechanics, uh, the environment, the story, of course, and everything to help really put the player in Bernard's shoes to an extent. I was looking through some of the background and the the as as I saw it there at PAX and the idea even of as you're exploring Bernard's life and you're sort of like going back in time in some ways with the with the doorways and unlocking parts of it, you're progressing and understanding who Bernard is. And then I really liked also the idea that pe that people could could sort of see in terms of exploration. There's little side things that you can go and check out and do or discover. And you don't have to, they're, they're sort of like mm -hmm. side quest kind of ideas, but if you do, they carry forward and they become part of what, what you've sort of learned about and understood so far and might show up symbolically later. I think that's really fascinating, but the core, the core of understanding this idea of memory loss of Bernard at this point in his life and where that's at and playing through it in this way and allowing the mechanics of the game and the narrative of the story to sort of immerse you in, in what that feels like and what, what Bernard is, is sort of at and going through and coming to terms with potentially and sort of how it may, may resolve at, at the end, that I think is, is really fascinating and a really, cool, a, a really cool thing for games to get into, you know, for, for games to more and more games to sort of explore this idea of we're going to we're going to show you uh something we're also going to tell you something we're also going to let you be something or let you feel something to learn something new mm -hmm. we had an interview with eduardo weissman which we like to talk about and he they did far cry 6 from ubisoft right so far cry 6 one of the things that was fascinating to me that I don't think people really got with a game like that, you think, oh, guns, shooting, terrorists, we're going to go you know, blow some things up. They're really doing somewhat of the same thing. What they've done is they've in, they're exploring a political environment where the indigenous population is sort of being oppressed by a, an authoritarian government, and some of the citizens are sort of 
enlisted to help out and then you're part of a rebel group and conversations you have with maybe like the guards are are giving you a feeling of really what's sort of what's going on there what it's like to be in that environment and a lot of that came from people who lived in those kinds of oppressive environments so the playthrough the mechanics of how you might be able to talk to a guard and maybe maybe not just come up and shoot them or you know fight fight your way through a thing because it's just another person that exploring of an idea and being immersed in the environment and learning what's going on through the mechanics through the play i think is is fascinating and, and i think it's really a kind of a new frontier right because we're used to thinking of games as teaching us things like um faster response times and, and eye coordination and map rating skills yes <laughs> and like puzzle solving and to some small extent interacting with other human beings <laughs> yeah but yeah learning something emotional right yeah that might be the future of games i think uh last of us part two have uh, in those games that i really like this game is kind of amazing the way they work with with your mind and or you grow and learn from it i don't know i i'm a big fan of this game the, the fact that yes. you just I, I don't want to spoil anything for anyone that <laughs> didn't play the game but you can learn so much and you as a player and the way you go through it and the way you fight through it is really different depending on how you you're touched by the story and the character on both sides of it it's amazing what they did with it and if you're able to learn something about yourself too that's just right incredible yeah right or or help help you deal with something of your own whether it's mm -hmm. directly related or indirectly so we'll talk more about Spiral. We'll, we'll get into it in some more de detail because I think there's some fascinating mechanical things as part of it. But let's talk about both of you as well. And we can we can go back and forth and the origin of folklore and how you got into this. Uh, so why don't we why don't we start with Mikhail? Because I think that started first and then and then just got got roped in, pulled in. <laughs> uh, so go ahead, Mikhail. Sure. So technically, folklore is an old company. Uh, but we are new at the same time. When I, I at the end of my bachelor degree uh, with two of my colleagues, one of the last work was creating a card game, and the, the our teacher was impressed by the concept and he suggested that we try to uh, release it with Kickstarter. And we are going way back. At that time, Kickstarter was limited only to the United, United States. So in Canada, we were not able to release something on Kickstarter. So okay. to go through all the hoops to reach that point, we needed to uh, create a company, which was not called Folklore at the time, uh, and eventually create a bank account and open another bank account in the United States. And a lot of hoops like that we needed to cross to be able to release on Kickstarter. So we did all that. And when we were ready, Kickstarter opened, opened the, the, the project for Canada also. So we did all of this for nothing in the end, but we still did the, the whole process, released our game, which was, I mean, I, I try to forget <laughs> the game. It, it's, it's not that amazing, but it, it's cute. It's our first game. It's more- uh, you, you try to play. forget it, but just <laughs> made sure that we had it on the agenda so that we would not forget it. So why don't you describe the game? Because I want to hear about it. It's and important. It's the beginning of folklore. I know he doesn't <laughs> like it and it's, he is not quite proud of it, but it's a game. We did something and it sold yeah. a couple of copy and it went to some shop. So I think it's a great story, <laughs> but it, what, if he doesn't what, like what it. Is, what is the card game? And uh, we're going to have to get some pictures. Have you ever well. played uh, Werewolves, the card yes. game? So yep. to an extent, it, it has similarities. So you have two factions and a captain. So the cap it's a, a pirate game called Mutiny. And you have the captain, which is neutral. And you have on one side the loyal shipmates and the traitors. So the traitors are trying to poison the captain. And the shipmates want to save the captain and poison the traitors instead. So every third There's a video each... on YouTube. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> wait, so, wait, so wait, so what was the name again? We'll make sure uh, people mutiny. hear about it. Mutiny. <laughs> yeah. Mutiny, the card game. It's out of print right now, I think. So people are <laughs> yeah. going to have to like 
People are going to have to to get to, to folklore and beg for them to <laughs> revisit it and republish the, the game. Um, but but people can look it up. That, that sounds awesome. Game that sounds in, great. in a basement with with some glue trying to put the bugs together. <laughs> and yeah. put you'll, have to, you'll have to print yeah, all of our to paper craft the cards. to try to send them away because all of it was done in our own. <laughs> <laughs> so so that kicked it off and then yeah. and then how did where did when did it turn into folklore uh after we released mutiny we just like to an extent we're done with what we had in mind so all the yep. uh, the the owner at the time just went their separate ways uh one left the company another one went in, into the industry on my side they started to do freelance and I still had in mind to eventually come back to folklore and create our own games. But for some time, I mean, we didn't have a team, we didn't have money, we didn't have a project, we had nothing. So we just left it on the side. And that was for quite a while. I, I mean, technically, we worked with another company in 2016, 2017 uh, on a small uh, mobile game that is also out uh, of existence. Uh, but we were not the owner of the game. I, we're just doing some yeah. tech support. Uh, and eventually in 2018, the idea of Spiral started to take root. And at that point, I, I, I mean, Jessica was already with us. Uh, she replaced the owner that left. So I think it was in 2015, 16, yes. something like that. 15. And yeah, and so Spiral took root. I brought it to the team and eventually we started working on it. At the end of 2018, we're in early concept. We're just pitching ideas and trying to figure out what we wanted to do with the game. And in 2019, then we started our first prototype, which was fairly, well, the large, let's say, guidelines <laughs> of what Spiral would become were there, but it was not Spiral yet. It it, it it crystallized more in early 2020 when we started production. That 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 point that was spiral. That Got prototype it. also have a video on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's great. It's great to see those kinds of things. A lot of studios will sort of really hide that that kind of thing, but I think for all of us that are really interested in what goes on and how this stuff gets developed, I I love to see that. So <laughs> I like to see the first draft and the first the first video mm -hmm. we did, and it was. Uh, one of our team uh, member that did it because we didn't know how to do a trailer and we were going to an event and we didn't need needed one. So it just make it for us. And now the new one that was made uh, that we paid for and both of them together. I just like all of the all we did between those two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can see you can see how far it's it's sort of evolved and, yeah. and sort of what's what's there and what's different. So, so Jess, you joined in 2016, 2017-ish? Yeah. Uh, more 15, but I was not, 15? I was, uh, I was there, but I didn't do anything because I was not in the game industry at the time. I was just being part of it. Well, we, <laughs> yeah. none of us did anything at that point. You just, yeah. you became an owner <laughs> with us. <laughs> yeah. You own nothing so, with us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But when we start uh, working on Spiral, I was just uh, amazed at how we didn't have uh, a structure. We didn't have anything to build from. We had a drive with uh, two folder on it and everything put it in. And when someone was searching for anything, in fact, they were like, I, I don't know. Put it in the folder again so I can reach it. And I was trying to build something so we can move around and work together as a team in it and understand and and find what we needed so it's the beginning of me uh, at folklore games trying to make us uh, organize organized thing <laughs> right yeah and she's so always setting herself short so <laughs> as she mentioned at that point we we had no structure at all and i remember then when she joined officially the spiral team she was not just part of folklore but part of spiral as a project manager we felt immediately the change and I remember sitting in front of click, all our tools for structure in our organization, which is essentially ClickUp and Clockify and things like that. And I, I feel part of Real Studio now. I don't feel like I'm just working on, some, working on something on the side as just a project. It's 
we are officially a company with structure and we know we are where <laughs> we are heading. And I, I know I handle a lot of administrative stuff, but structure is not my strong suit. So <laughs> the reason why Spiral yeah. is moving forward and we know where we are heading is essentially because of her. <laughs> That's Thank that's you. that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that 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 that's great to hear. And I think you're absolutely right. As soon as you have some of that structure in place, it does. It makes it more real. It makes it feel more real. It also, in some ways, can make us more accountable to the project. And in and you know, and having a project manager there to to organize <laughs> things and can make people more accountable and. Uh, have be more invested in the project as well. So you'll you'll come to the table with with your best ideas then because you've got this structure that it, they're being plugged into and they're not just like floating off into space or getting lost in a chat window. Um, <laughs> so that is excellent. And I know you do more than that, Jess. It's, it's not just the the project management and it's the sort of the administration running of the of the teams, but now some of the communications and marketing as well, right? I'm working with uh, our community manager uh, for planning and stream and social media and things like that. So uh, she's holding more on the uh, TikTok, Twitter, community management side and yep. the TikTok because I'm too old for that. <laughs> but You're too old for that. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have no hope in it ever. It's I should okay. just uninstall it's okay. it from my phone. We, ju we just need to accept it. <laughs> I'm too old for TikTok. I don't understand any of I it. I don't know. I just I just watch TikTok when someone sends it to me in the mail. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> On a th There's yeah. a link in my mailbox. I'm just over on a oh. postcard. <laughs> yeah. Dear Sima, I have for you one of these talk things that I think you should take a look at. <laughs> Yours forever. <laughs> yeah. Exactly like that. So she's doing an amazing job because I'm like, I don't know how I'm supposed to open it, <laughs> but uh, we're working together. Like when we launched our Kickstarter camping, uh, we were together. Like I was uh, planning, planning everything and she's was writing the bus and I was scheduling it. Um, all the press release, those things, trying to, uh, to make ourselves known because, uh, it's really hard uh, as indie yeah. when we did nothing to try yeah. to push ourselves out and have visibility because when we go to an event, it's always really nice because we have the chance to meet people and people are amazing and so nice and incredibly kind and generous uh, with their feedback. But when we get home beyond our computer, it's always harder because there are so many games and so many great games trying to do the right. same. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's quite difficult. Uh, yeah, and and Mikhail, you said um, you had been you had d degree, you had some some training in in games development. Obviously, you are now the the CEO and the creative director, uh, but you're also still very deep into technology. And in fact, our uh, instructor professor in in teaching other people game development as well, right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming you are waiting for more than a, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, Usually that's how no no question so work. <laughs> but yeah, yes, yeah. Next. I started, uh, I think the first class I teach was probably around 2017, I think. At that time, I was teaching uh, Unity. Uh, which seems absurd to an extent nowadays because I haven't touched Unity since I teached it five <laughs> years ago. Uh, since then, uh, every teaching contract has been with uh, Unreal. So that's what we're using for Spiral. And that is the first, well, technically the first engine was UDK, which is the ancestor of Unreal 4. I started with that and eventually okay. moved on to, uh, to the Unreal engine. And I've been teaching it more regularly for the last i think three years now i i have at least four or five class each year for the past three years so yeah and also uh, i've been doing contracts on the side for other company uh, uh trying either doing support or helping them transition towards the unreal engine i did this couple of company that were moving one with marketing so they never used the game engine before but with oh interesting there are yeah. so many things that's being done with Unreal. I mean, 
is the most common example that the Mandalorian it has been done entirely in engine in the Unreal Engine. So they are mixing shots and 3D and everything inside. So more and more people are using it outside of the game industry. So not so. just for games. Yeah. 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 Well, the do you, did you just say Mandalorian? That, yeah. That, yeah. To these TV shows, it, and it's fascinating to see if no, if people haven't seen it, the behind the scenes of the Mandalorian, which you can see on Disney Plus. There's one of the whole episodes of like their six behind the scenes series where they go into how the game engine is used and the practical combined with practical effects and the giant immersive, uh, you know, digital wall studio that you're they're using the game engine real time to do filming. So they point a camera at the actors with the game engine behind them. And that's how some of the filming is happening, which is fascinating. And then, as you said, in business, game engines being, well, now that we've got sort of the whole metaverse, but also uh, things like just, just marketing, creating marketing materials. We've been using 3D modeling for a long time in marketing. The whole IKEA catalog is all virtual. People don't realize that. You look at the kitchens that you're looking at in the IKEA website and none of it is physical and none of that ever existed it's all it's just all 3d renders then take that and put that in a game engine and you can stage things different ways you can do fly throughs things get really exciting um yeah so that's fascinating i won't maybe maybe if we have time at the end we can do unreal versus unity because uh and, and i didn't where even unreal knew is at. that that he worked on Unity. I did it. Uh, <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, you I just learned know. that today, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm Jess. <laughs> so, so now, now Jess has something new on the project plan that we're gonna, we're gonna add in the the Unity support. But I can already answer that question. I always answer the question really fast. Unreal versus Unity. It depends on what you do in life. So usually programmers yeah. would prefer Unity because they go can go hands on very easily and. Everyone else prefer Unreal because you don't need to know any coding <laughs> to be able to create something. But I know for yeah. programmers, it's a lot more work with Unreal because there's the Unreal, Unreal script, which is another language that you need to go through and there's more hoops. So it's more difficult to do programming with Unreal in Unreal versus you, which is why usually there's that preference for one versus the so other. So I have some coding skills uh, that are stale and dying, but <laughs> so I, I, I was a coder back in the day, uh, with, with when I worked for Microsoft, uh, back, you know, I did C, C plus plus. Now I still mostly code in C sharp if I'm going to do something, which works really well with unity. So I've done unity projects for HoloLens was the most of the actual projects that okay. I did, but I, I've started some Picking, picking it back up on the side, uh, I do get, because I've done a lot in Blender, I do get node systems and, and understand uh, how that kind of can, can operate and be very, very powerful. So I've been fascinated by Unreal, but I haven't gotten into it yet. But your point of the right tool for the right job, what you're most comfortable with, what you're most productive with, and it, what, you, what you need the engine to do, that's going to dictate what engine you end up using and it's not yeah. it's not a a binary choice and it's not a one size fits all choice so that's no. a good answer <laughs> okay so let's get back to spiral what was the so we've got you know we've got bernard as as sort of like the main story and this idea of of memory loss um what you know, where did, where did you come up with wanting to to sort of explore that as an idea so I guess that's me that's up again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't remember when it, it's been so long, but many years ago, all at the same time, my grandmother and two of her sisters were all diagnosed uh, with cognitive degeneration disease. So our grandmother, I, did my, I, I said my, our grandmother, just yeah. being my sister, I don't think we, we mentioned so far. I don't think uh, we did yet, but I think people <laughs> probably would have picked Hi. it up. But yeah. <laughs> So uh, she was diagnosed with dementia. Uh, one of her sister was uh, Alzheimer, and the third one was just a generic cognitive degeneration, the cognitive degeneration disease without a name. So at that point, it, it hit me fairly hard. Uh, I I'd say in all my life uh, before that point, I always thought I was. Not fearless, but not with, without that, a very large, some people are terrified by something and I wasn't terrified by anything. And at that point, I realized that was, that's the one thing that was going to terrify me for the rest of my life. 
Uh, so all those emotions, my selfish fear and uh, our <laughs> grandmother being affected and all of that uh, was a turmoil in me. And I, the way I express myself is through game design. So I started thinking at that point, it, it was just, just blips of ideas and nothing concrete. And it took a few years before I decided to bring the idea I felt was, let's say, ready enough uh, to present to the rest of the team. And I started pitching it. Uh, I pitched it to uh, Jeff and Jess, we, who were the owner with me of Folklore at the time. And I was also working with Audrey, who is now our art director. And they agreed that it was a good idea. So we started developing more. As I mentioned, late 2018, we just pitched concept and tried to figure out what would become Spiral. Small anecdote, at the very, 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 very beginning, for about a few weeks, uh, Spiral was heading to be a uh, isometric action, well, not action, but RPG, let's say isometric action-ish RPG game. So we are very far from that result, uh, but for a few yeah. weeks, that was in the cards. And the more we discussed, the more we decided to remove parts and eventually we let we were left with focusing entirely on the story and exploration and bernard and focusing also on the uh, on the way the game will be affected by cogn cognitive degeneration disease and remove everything else so yeah which is fascinating so that that idea i mean it, it sounds to me sort of to be two parts there which was uh one is having that direct experience and you being able to draw on that to be able to tell this story but the second, which I think is even more important, is your own fear, and this I think this gets gets to all of us as well. Of what what is that like? What you know? What w is that going to happen to me? And if it does, how am I going to deal with that? And what you know? Sort of where did where does that lead to? And it's you know it's it's scary as you said, and being able to work through that as an artist, I think is is fascinating, but. A lot of us aren't artists and we don't have those skills and you being able to sort of create this world for us to sort of explore through the mechanics that, that you've put together is a huge opportunity. You introduced me to, uh, uh, Brenda Romero, right? Brenda. Yeah. I keep forgetting your first name. <laughs> Sorry, Brenda. Uh, Brenda is a giant in the games industry. She's done a lot. Um, she married John Romero. Um, She's done a lot of game publishing, game work of her own. Uh, but she wrote this book in, what was it, back in 2008. So 2008, she wrote the book, The Mechanic is the Message. And what she did then with the book and the idea and some of the games that she then started making and publishing was very related to this. It, it was, how can the mechanics of a game help help us as humans sort of explore an idea and understand an idea beyond just it, just having a story told to us. So as I said, it's sort of in the intro show. Don't tell is a, is an axiom that's used in film, for example, so that you're not just narrate, you know, you don't just have exposition telling the audience something, What's much more powerful in film, for example, is, showing them that so they can sort of experience it as, as the story moves along. We've come around to this in a couple of our conversations so far, play don't show, which is, I think, a, an evolution of that. Games can take this a whole step further. And then the idea of the mechanic is the message, taking, taking the idea that w the way you play and how you work through the story and the narrative uh, being a piece of learning about the process, I think is fascinating. So I, I, I know that's, you, you, you mentioned this, I know this is sort of where you're coming from. Why don't you describe a little bit of, of that mechanic and in the, you know, the various mechanics and, and you guys can, t can tag team and go back and forth, <laughs> but the, the various mechanics and spiral that, that allow you to experience some of this and, and sort of internalize it. Uh, sure. It's, <laughs> It's all, something that's always changing to an extent. We know a lot of things. There, well, there's already a lot of elements that are in the game and things we want to add, but sometimes we realize something is not working. So that's very complex 
element we are playing with because we need also to walk a fine line between making the player understand and feel what Bernard is feeling and just plainly frustrating the player. We could right. go all right. the way and make it a very frustrating, frustrating game, but at that point, well, we are going to lose people and they won't be able to feel what they could have feel uh, if they enjoy the game more. That's not our goal at all. We don't want to make people just pissed off. So <laughs> uh, I'd say our main piece as well, of course, as I mentioned, there's, there's going to, well, let's start from the beginning. So at the beginning of the game, we have very, very little effects from the de degeneration disease. This thing now very grounded and Bernard remembers everything fairly clearly. And as the game going to progress, the disease is going to be more and more present and start to creep in everything. It's going to affect the environment. That's the easiest, way, the easiest one to explain. So the environment is going to be broken apart. There's going to be pieces missing. And I think you see it already on the banner behind Jess. So just pieces of environment floating around the void, which is the place where the, this, the spiral staircase is going to be more and more present inside of the, of the scene. And also in the demo, we see it with the environment just being broken apart and leaving essentially where Bernard is. We're going to have elements also affecting the, well, it's two part for this segment. So we have elements that in the story itself, the way we're telling it, Bernard is going to be more and more confused for getting things, confusing things. But we also have a second part, which is depending how, on how the player is going to play the game. So if they take their time to explore everything and learn as much as possible, Bernard is going to remember each character for a longer period of time. However, if the player decides to rush through everything and just do the main, let's say main quest, main part of the story and avoid everything else, Bernard is going to forget the characters much faster. And depending on how much you remember a character, the story is also affected. To give you an idea, I, I, I find it funny to use that scene, but in scene nine, I cannot tell you what's happening in that scene, but we have, I think, 12 different versions, depending on which character is remembered oh, wow. or forgotten wow. or how much that character is forgotten. Sometimes the changes are very small and sometimes the whole scene is completely different depending if Bernard is still remembering that character, confusing it with something, someone else. So sometimes the character is removed completely, which changes the flow. But sometimes the character being too important for that scene, the memories is warped and Bernard remembers them at someone, someone else or the way their relations is changed or things like that. So that's also a large part that's affected by the narrative. Uh, more on, let's say, the UI part, the same thing. We're going to have the, the, the journal where, where Bernard writes everything and you fill it out every time you meet a character or do, do something is going to become more and more empty as Bernard forgets. Also, that's also in the demo directly. Uh, the UI, the UI is going to fall apart, being broken apart. Uh, and I mean, not only the journal, but also the pause menu, the main menu, things like that, with just making it more. Essentially, we want the player to feel lost with things he understood and was used to it and become, he has that same feeling of where are things? Where are, wasn't right. that supposed to be here? And things like that. Um, same thing for the, the prompts. So the way you're going to interact with everything the, the prompt that's being shown to you won't be the same. Uh, subtitles. So that's one that's still on the... I'm not <laughs> sure if it's going to be used or not, but we would like to have the subtitles eventually... Well, the names of the characters speaking would be erased, but also we want to warp what's in the subtitles. For example, you hear something, but something completely different is written. So that Being one is... On parts, that one is on, super interesting, <laughs> yeah. but I... I really want, if we do that, I really want us to have an accessibility um, just menu. menu so we can, Options. if you need yeah. those, if you really need them, you just don't want to ease your way with the subtitle and you need them, you can just say, hey, don't do that to me, <laughs> please. <Right. laughs> 
Right. Or yeah. Or, or, or maybe like two, two sets of subtitles. Yeah. You know, this, this is what Bernard, you know, this is what was actually said, but this is, this is what Bernard is hearing kind of thing. Um, because at the beginning, when we start working uh, on Spiral, we met with an organization, a uh, foundation for the Alzheimer in Montreal. And when we spoke to them, we already wanted to go uh, the path to be uh, inside of Bernard's mind and really tell his story because uh, that's what we wanted to tell. But when we meet them, they all they talk a lot about uh, the representation of uh, the generations being always about others, about how others feel and how they are impacted, and never about how those people left alone and l lost. So we wanted to go deeper in that way. So when we put our our mechanic in our path, we wanted to make their own unreliable narrator. I I might have an issue with that. Yeah, word. I'm yeah. Sorry. unreliable narr that, narrator. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. <laughs> so that's the what we want to push with our mechanic and the way we change the env environment and everything else in the game. I think that's really an advanced set of of game design. And yeah, I in, do too. In a few different ways, I think the idea of I I I really got hooked when and you mentioned this at PAX, and this is this is something that that made me write write a note on the side as the idea that not only is what Bernard sees and you know what Bernard's doing and the environment and the graphics are sort of breaking apart, but the the menus and the user interface and and all of that sort of flowing and following as well. So you're as the player at even in a meta way outside of the game to, you know, outside of the, the, the role that, that Bernard is, is playing, feeling it yourself. That's, I think that's, that, that's kind of a breakthrough. Losing uh, what you're taking for granted the same way the, the person affected by it will do. That's really want, what we wanted to do with it. The idea that you have so many branching paths. We talked to Ashley Rule of Bioware. And one of the things that Bioware and Star Wars The Old Republic and their games like to do is lots of choices. And then the choices create branches. And there is sort of a, uh, and maybe it's a project management, so maybe this is a question for you, Chaz. <laughs> there's, there's all of these branches that then can, can end up. And if you get to, you know, C9 and you have 12 potential uh, situations or options or, or different realities that you have to, to sort of tell a story through or program to, how do you organize all of that and how do you keep all of that at, and how do you keep track of all of that when you're trying to like then do scene 10? <laughs> it's going to be the, the choice master uh, that's <laughs> well, going to answer that one. <laughs> the, to answer that question, that's why we are staying away from choices. So the, the way the player is going to play the game is how they are affecting each scene, but they are never prompted with do you want to go with choice A or choice B or option C? It's the way they play that's going to affect each scene. And each of those scenes are tied directly with the disease progress. And depending on how the game, all the bigger has played, is going to affect the scene. But it's not a branching path that's branching again and branching again. The reason why there are so many options is because in that spe specific scene, there are so many characters going to be affected. But next one, for example, uh, well, not the next one, there's also many. But the one after, there's fewer characters. <laughs> so there's going to be fewer options for what's going to be affected depending on how much we not remember each of those characters. So it can grow fairly intense for some of those things, but it's not exponential. We Got are it. still a small indie studio with very limited found yeah. so we aren't unable to go in well at scene 25 we have 1200 options so what are we going to do with them <laughs> so someone so someone in that room maybe maybe the one that just spoke uh, <laughs> at some point told me that choice are not always just in your face you don't have always the do you want this or this sometimes it's right. just uh -huh. you deciding what you're want to do and that have consequence and that itself is a choice. So. Yes. Yes. And, and what Ashley sort of taught us was if, if the player feels like what they're doing matters, then that's what matters. The fact that, that they're, even if, even if they are presented with multiple choices and they pick one or they pick another and still the same thing happens, as long as the player feels agency and, and feels part of it, 
I think what you've done, though, I think is is a really clever way to go about it, which is less about, as you said, creating all these branching paths and more about almost almost like an inventory of of things that you've done. You know, so if, if you've if you've done this side path, well, then you've done that side path and that then becomes part of of your collection so that you can react to that collection of things that the, that the player has done rather than say, you know, what, what are all the branches that, that have, have, have resolved? You, you sort of solve it. She said one of the things they do is, is when they do have branching paths in the story, they like make notes on some of the in-game characters. Like, hey, the, you know, this Sith Lord, you know, we can't have this Sith Lord because as a main character, because he's dead in some people's scenes or whatever. Yours, it's more like, well, let's look at the inventory of what things this, this, the player has done and that will affect how we present the characters that are in this particular scene or chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, seems like a great way to go about it. It's like he's creating foundation. Uh, the player is creating for a foundation for the memory of Bernard. So when we take from it, if there is more, it took longer to just forget. But it's still happening, but it's happening slower because you have more to remember before he is losing it. So Right. Interesting. After listening to you guys talk about your game, I, I want to know what you want from a player, the overall thing that that they should expect to get from the game. Like, is it because with a name like Spiral and and the topic that you've picked to talk about, it could convey, oh, this is going to be a really depressing experience. You're just going to keep on spiraling <laughs> downward. But <laughs> Is that what you're looking for? Like teach a lesson about how bad it is or is it an uplifting thing or is it a fun, you know, whimsical thing or what are you, what, what do, what, when I play the game, what am I going to be experiencing? I think we want uh, people to live with what they want from it. I know Mikael have uh, <laughs> uh a moment at PAX that was perfect for him. And that was the, <laughs> e- everything that he wanted from the game to do to the player. That was it. I We don't want to make a depressing game. We want to put into light uh, those people and to give the opportunity to, to people to learn from it and have empathy and care and patience and just... I don't know. It, we don't want it to be depressing. The, the subject itself is enough. Uh, it's going to get a bit dark because the subject is, but it's really the life of Bernard and we're going through it with him. So there's light and there's sadder moment, but the all of it is what you want to remember. The, the fact that he's losing it is the sad part. It's not his life that is. So mm-hmm. probably Mikael is That's a beautiful about, balance. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I... I had a conversation with someone. I told him about what we were going to be talking about today. At, that it was about, um, you know, giving a voice to memory loss in a way. And and my friend said, "Oh, it's an educational game." And I'm like, "No, <laughs> no." But I can see where people would jump to that conclusion too. So something I, I don't know why she didn't mention herself, but something she frequently say or or, or hope with Spiral is in, in many fold, I'd say. Uh, we want, of course, empathy. We want to open up discussion, sensibilize, and uh, or with the end of the game, which is indeed, of course, sad. I won't spoil anything by saying that Bernard wants to remember everything at the end of the game. Uh, but our goal with the end of the game is acceptance, both for Bernard and mm-hmm. for the player. So that's something we want to do transmit to the player so we don't want to end well we don't want to end with someone depressed but more accepting understanding with empathy yeah almost coming to peace with yeah with with what it is overcoming the fear potentially Mm -hmm. i i think is is the sense i got so folklore.games people can go and look which is a beautiful website you guys did that did did a great job and is this a, is this a font? This handwriting, I love the text. Yeah, it is. It's a font. Wow, the, that's so cool. The person who did that uh, font, I've made a couple of them that are in the game, and they are just are oh, so cute and amazing. They work so <laughs> well with the game. Uh, I was in love when I we found them, and I was like, it's perfect. Oh uh, yeah, it 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 is great. Um, 
but then if you if you if people dig into that folklore.games and i like some of the you i mean you wrote some some words around this which gave me a little bit of that sense you said while cognitive degeneration is not an easy subject we don't want to make a tragic game spiral's objective is to start start a discussion to make you feel empathy patience and love we want to make a game that makes you understand how important the little things in life are and how we sometimes take them for granted and then as you said, Mikhail, that I- idea of which I think I bet we all feel, which is the the fear and that fear mostly coming from or a lot of it probably coming from lack of understanding. Being able to sort of work through that, work through that yourself and, and internalize that, um, I, I think, is an important mission. But people shouldn't, uh, you know, underestimate how how beautiful and interesting and compelling the game is when you get your hands on it too. And you could sort of see that from the, from the videos too. So it's, it's not, I, I hope people aren't, aren't hearing this thinking it it's, you know, it's, it's like just, it's just like teaching you something. It's like some therapy session. Right. Which but, is why I brought it up. Cause I wanted yeah. them to have a chance to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Cause so, so describe, describe some of those, like the mechanics and the mini games and the, the, like almost like the puzzle solving kind of thing that, 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 that are going on that are going to really pull people through, even if they want to kind of like ig- ignore the, the message. There's, there's still a, a really cool game and art and world that you've created. Yeah, uh, we have a few main mechanics. Unfortunately, most of them are still on the wrap, so I cannot mention <laughs> okay. them, but we already have <laughs> the fishing mechanics Mechanic and the uh, well, you said fishing, mechanic. and that caught my ear. I, I yeah, see my, mine I too. too. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. We love fishing in games. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think those, let's say, main mechanics are going to come back at least twice, sometime more throughout the game. So fishing, we open with it, and we are going to sit again at the end of the game. We are creating a loop with that. I cannot speak of the other end of the loop, but the first one is when <laughs> uh, Bernard's father is teaching him how to fish. You have and... a peek, uh, a peek of it uh, in the demo. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the fishing. The, fishing uh, the stealth is coming is going to be repeated more. Uh, we see twice in the first five scenes of the game, and uh, a third time later on in the game, uh, and that one is more. We. What we're trying to do with all our mechanics, we don't want something that is too complex. We want something that you can just jump in and do and and then instantly understand. So in those scenes, you need to hide from either, uh, well, Monique, the, the, my uh, earlier example, when she's trying to punish the siblings. In fact, not just Bernard, but Bernard and his sister. And they are hiding from her and trying to get in a safe spot which doesn't really exist i mean yeah she's their mother so they, moms, they moms, won't get away mad. <laughs> you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get out of the way yeah. and a few more scenes and once it's a bit difficult to talk about what we want to do because another thing is that with all of those mechanics they i mean we we talked about it they're never just a mechanic they're there to bring a feeling and serve the story Mm -hmm. and things like that so without all the pieces and because some are also on the wrap i cannot explain you the whole thing but i think the closest one i can do is what you mean david finch is a good example of what we're aiming for like you can follow the story and go deep inside of it and try to find the meaning behind it or you can just accept that they did an amazing job doing all of those mechanics in sync with the story it's it's a big inspiration for us uh, in that kind of game so if we we don't we forget the story about uh, the cognitive degenerations uh, it's it's that kind of game that we are aiming for and as as you said it's also exploration and yeah. and and a, and a bit of mystery so yeah. and there's those... multiple smaller mechanics so just in the first thing you can yeah. play fetch fetch with the dog you can like, water uh plants and things like that and oh if you can yeah. play with the dog that's another highlight <laughs> that's that's another thing that <laughs> you can pet the dog <laughs> right the dog. have to be able to pet the dog yeah. that, <laughs> that's that is really exciting to hear you guys talk about that because i know a lot of games there's the story and then there's the mechanics 
and it and they're not really the same. Sort of like you you experience part of the story, you know, oh, the baby is lost down the well. I, I in order to save her, you have to go kill ten rats, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And on your way to kill the rats, you realize, oh, you need a stick and the stick is at the store, so then you have to go to the store. You know, it's like <laughs> Good point. But this is I like what you said about them being in sync, the mechanics being in sync and bringing the story with with it. Yeah. That's right. Uh, if we want to start another debate, that, that's another huge <laughs> one which happened a few years ago. Well, many years ago, I guess now, and which was uh, narratology versus ludology, which is should you create a game? Should you create a story and then put mechanics in that story or should you create the mechanics and just apply a story over it? And I think most people, most company are mostly ignoring that, let's say, debate, which is almost a bit more academic than actual developers. But we we are really firmly in the middle. We believe that you do not create mechanics and apply a story over it or create a story and just try to make it a game with it. But you create both at the same time and try to, to have everything intertwined. The mechanics should serve the story and the story should serve the, the gameplay. Otherwise. You, you, if they are not intertwined, it's I, I, I think it's a loss because if you mm -hmm. just want to tell a story, there, there are so many medium where you can tell a story. And if you are not interested, interested to do anything else than the gameplay, well, I think you are underserving yourself with removing the fact that you can make people experience emotions, understand, pass a message and things like that. So, Again, I'm wrapping a very large <laughs> debate in a few. No, uh, <laughs> no this, is, this is great. And I, I think it's really important to give people a taste of these kinds of concepts and ideas that are deeper behind game, game development and set game development as a medium apart from, you know, from, from books and from movies. And, and in some ways, push, push into a new way of storytelling that, that that needs space to develop on its own in a, in a really brand new way. And, you know, Sarah from Max, uh, uh, Maxis, Maxis, Max, <laughs> and <laughs> Ashley from Bioware, uh, both of them as, you know, even coming from AAA studios are trying to push in that direction, which is let games be games and let's, let's do the new things that we can do with games in some really new and interesting ways and not limit ourselves to any old ways of storytelling because we we've got this power available to us we've got this this capability yeah i that i love these concepts i i and each each time i i hear a new one i i'm like putting it in my pocket so <laughs> when i when i develop my game someday which will, will never come I will, <laughs> I will have all of these. I'll be able to talk about the design and all the smart <laughs> ideas that all of the people have talked about. Speaking of what are specific to games, I think we're going back again with uh, Brenda Romero. When I think she's the one that mentioned that games come with an emotion that you know, games are the only one that you can uh, that make experience that emotion, which is complicity. You cannot be complicit by reading a book or listening to music or watching a movie, but in a game, you become complicit of what you are doing because uh -huh. you actively decide to do that action. And I know, and, and now I'm, I'm going back to, <laughs> to myself, I apologize for that, but uh, when I presented my, uh, my thesis for my master's degree, I received a question, which was about choices, I received a question, but what do you, how are you complicit in a game without choices? And Players always always have one choices in front of them, no matter what the game gives them, is to just put down the controller and walk away. Mm -hmm. So you are always making a choice. You are always complicit of what you're doing on screen. You choose to continue to do so. If you do not, and I did many times in my life, decided no, that that game is not working for me. Sometimes it's because I did not enjoy it, and sometimes it's because what's what was on the screen, I I did not agree with it. You, put down the control and you still have that power so and yeah, sometimes you, you forget about that <laughs> that's right I, yeah. well. when i was at the end of the last of uh, sport 2 i didn't want the last scene i was seeing what where it was going 
and I didn't like it and I didn't agree with it and I didn't want to do it because it wasn't my choice and I didn't want it. And he was, just do it. You need to do it. You don't have a choice. And I was like, that's, that's false. You told me yeah. that I had the power and the choice to just put that There's control down. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's right. right. And you that's can, right. Right. You can, and, and you can put it down and you can walk away. You can, you can, you know, you can close the game. <laughs> that, that complicity, you mentioned, you mentioned complicity, agency and complicity. The hearing you describe it there really nails it home for me. And it's another, another great concept that I'm, I'm really going to in- internalize being, being complicit in the story because you are playing it, you're doing it, mm-hmm. takes it to a whole new level. And Seema, you know, we've experienced this. So we played Star Wars, the old Republic, one of the main games that we've played over the years. We have a separate podcast that we've, we've done on that with Bioware. <clears throat> In there, you've got this idea of the you can either be you be on the the imperial side or the republic side. You can be a you know you can be dark side or light side even within those. So you can play as you know maybe you want to experience more of the stories. So you go play a dark side you know a Sith warrior or whatever. There is and I feel this all the time. I feel complicity all the time when I play games, and I will. I'll stop. I won't do it. I you know I. You know, you're you're if I'm going to be this Sith Lord, this is this is what I have to do. Well, fine. I'm going to delete this character. I'm not going to do that. I because <laughs> I do. I feel that complicit, the, be, you know, com, complicit, complicity, <laughs> right? <laughs> not complacency, but com, I feel complicit. So and I see I know you've felt this, the same way, right? Uh, absolutely. In fact, I, you even made me think of. Um, in I, I also play a lot of WoW and. The wow, some of some game devs and wow feel that it's really funny for players to play a quest where they have to put their hands in animal poop. (laughs) You know, like you got to go and you got to get the berries out of this because you're going to make this potion with it. You can skip those quests if you don't want to put your hands in (laughs) animal (laughs) poop. And people don't realize they think, oh, I got this quest from the quest giver. That means I have to go do it. But you don't. Nope. And if you do, you're complicit. You're a, you're a poop pants. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's also a way for, for game designers in some way because they're trying to evoke some emotion. And maybe the, in, and sometimes they do it in a really clumsy way, which is we're going to force the player to do this and it's going to make them feel a thing um, because we're going to force that complicit, com, uh, force them to be complicit in some you know, distasteful activity. There's, there's even on the Alliance side in a couple of the, I think it might even have been a sort of like a required main storyline quest in one of the past expansions where you kind of have to do some mild torture. You have to like shock, shock some dude until he tells you the answer. And a lot of people notice that a lot of people sort of and chafed at that because you do especially in these kinds of games where you're internalizing your you're alongside a character or your role mm-hmm. play, your rpg being complicit in that kind of activity can really feel bad and if you're clumsy as a developer hopefully where, it feels bad yeah if if you're clumsy as a developer where you force that just for the shock value or to to make some you know to to make somebody feel something. And I think that's, I think that can potentially be an evidence of, of poor design. Um, so yeah. Fascinating concept. Um, this, this is great. I've, I've learned, I've learned a ton. Uh, <laughs> I think and it I, goes I, and in ends with, uh, the, the fact that we're pushing, uh, a lot of, uh, violent game and we're going for the more realistic game and it's getting, gory and realistic and the fact that you're forcing people into that complicity in those really realistic game with a lot of blood and a lot of murdering people and i don't know i i'm i'm always of the on the fence with game being more and more realistic and more and more gory and yeah forcing player into being part of it i don't know (laughs) What fascinates me is when players break, break, break the game to the point where they they figure out a way within the mechanics to have the the pacifist playthrough. <laughs> yeah, you know, so they they'll even take one of those fighting games or the combat games or 
and they'll they'll figure out the way that they can you know get around everything and like complete the story in a pacifist playthrough and i kind of think even if you're going to just make a you know whatever kind of fighting game providing that kind of flexibility so that they're the the people that do internalize that complicit being complicit having that opportunity is is kind of clever and, and kind of a cool way to go about it all right we've been talking a, a ton i so let's let's wrap it up with a little bit of a look <laughs> into the future spiral so let's do two parts one we'll do with with jess on what, so what what can we expect in terms of roadmap on Spiral? When do, when do you hope it's going to, because you always ask the project manager, you don't ask the developer when it's going to be done. <laughs> you ask the project manager. Because the developer, they're in this creative space. They're like creating worlds. And when's it going to be done? I don't know. It never, always. <laughs> no, it's, it's a process. <laughs> so you ask, you ask the project manager. So you tell us that, and then we'll ask about the, the, the future of folklore with uh, Mikhail. It's a difficult question because uh, on that part uh, is as much as <laughs> me into that decision. We have a lot of plan depending on our situation. Since we're self-funded, depends on a lot of things. So the answer can go from next year to the year after. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a big yeah. big question. <laughs> it's looking it's, beautiful, you know. Thank so you. we wanted to make uh, we want to make the game. As as close as what we're seeing in our head and what we're expecting from it, that we we want to polish it and we don't want to rush into anything, and we need to uh, consider our fund and uh, the way we are uh, working part time at the moment. So it it depends right. on a lot of things. <laughs> it's a hard right. question to answer at the moment. No, I I get that. <laughs> Did I answer right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> No, that, I, yeah, that's a good I would add that next year is becoming more and more unlikely. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I'll yeah. share something that we've heard from multiple developers, which is that at some point, your new ideas, you draw a line and the new ideas are for the next release of your game. There you go. There maybe, maybe, maybe that'll help you. Maybe because that, help you get it I, you, you'll later. never stop having great ideas. I for, don't <laughs> want to throw flowers at us. But I'd say we have been very, very good with preventing any uh, feature creep. So we decided <laughs> when we started in 2020 what good. the game would be, the number of scenes, what was, what was going to be inside of those scenes. And we did not add anything since then. And we, are, we built the game in a way that if need be, we can remove scenes to save us some time. So we are at least that. We, we, Oh, we are doing a good job knew, on that front. We already <laughs> knew it was a, a, a bigger project that, than what we have the capacity to do. We, that, so we, we know that we need to restrain ourselves and just put everything yeah. in a box and be sure that we follow those paths <laughs> because it's already big enough. <laughs> and, it, and it's a brilliant scope management technique to have to have the nice to have and the, you know, here's what we have to have. Here's what would be nice to have and be able to, to, to drop a couple things out if you, if you need to, uh, yeah. you're going to have a growing and a continue, a fan base that continues to grow. That's going to be demanding that they get their hands on the game. <laughs> and you know, that, that the, the, the mob is, is going to <laughs> grab their pitchforks and force you to release it before too long. So <laughs> we won't that Every mob. I Please. really like too that you 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 sussed me out too because you're, you you immediately knew that I was thinking that you're when you talk about a delay that it was due to scope creep and you, you schooled yeah. me on that one so I like it yeah. under control. <laughs> now, if we look past that, we could say we go out three, four, five, ten years. And Mikhail, what's what's sort of a what's 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 next? What's off in the future that that you could tease us well, with? Well, I can tease now uh, at. A nut tease? Anyway, it's a nut information, <laughs> but it's an information still. So uh, we have been advised a few months ago to uh, pitch a few concepts. Uh, it's CMF. Most of people, of the people are going to watch it. I have, I have no idea what that is, but it's uh, a governmental thingy. Funny. I, yeah. Yes. Anyway, they are helping uh, <laughs> develop multiple, multiple mm -hmm. uh, things in Canada, including games. And one of the things they do is help prototype games. So we've been advised to pitch them a few concepts. So we are currently 
getting every concept the team has and we're going to filter all that, pick a few ones in the end and pitch those to the CMF uh, eventually. Uh, so, so we're working on new ideas yeah. at the moment. <laughs> so they and he's either... quite excited right. about it. <laughs> <laughs> I see CMF, and I, I think that's who. So there's a game called Broken Inspector by a, a game studio called Games by Stitch, uh, mm -hmm. who we interviewed really early on, uh, out of coming out of PAX East, so Victoria. Um, but they, I think, I think this is the program that they were involved in too. It sounds it's I, it is CMF. But I'm fascinated by it, and it just sounds like a really great opportunity to get that kind of government level, community level, you know, country level support to do new and interesting things and push right. various media, but but definitely games, push push things forward. Uh, good, you know, good luck with that in a really yeah. Uh, Thank you. I, I mean, a, a couple of things she shared with us about that was, you know, first of all, you know, it, they wanted to be sort of Canadian, right? But also yeah. um, have something about it that's unique that there aren't already a bunch of different right. games doing something progressive which which in a way and i would would probably i mean probably counts yeah this just game the, for sure the, the core of the way you're approaching the game you know game design game narrative mechanics is, is the message i think that's and and even the content the 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 uh the, the content of the game probably qualifies alone um <laughs> But but yeah, I'm sure there's there's so many fascinating things. I can you tell you that into. it is not enough. Well, we we applied the wrong <laughs> one. We applied for the you know, there when you apply with CMF, you have the production line and innovative line, and we went with innovation, and okay. we were rejected because we do not have a technological innovation. Okay. Oh, so, okay. Hmm. Yeah, that and did I, not it's work. It's an Irish world. I, I, I can guess. Yeah, well, I can guess what they're what I, that that was my life, uh, and it kind of kind of still is. It was I was in technology innovation for 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 many many years, um, so I know all of the the key pillars of of what's sort of hot and interesting and you know hot hot topics coming out of there. So that that could be fascinating too. I'm I love so once once you have something to talk about. Once you have some ideas, I would love to catch up with you, even just on the side over coffee, because I love Perfect. the idea of brainstorming about how we can be using more leading edge digital innovation in game development. Because I, I feel like there's a ton of opportunity and nobody's really picking it up just yet. We're starting to scratch the surface, even some things like mid journey and uh, being able to do image generation, apply that to, uh, to dynamic, dynamically created content procedurally generated content with AI creating new scenes on the fly, that kind of thing, everything with AR, VR, mixed reality, that kind of thing. The, oh, there's, there's so many fun things that we can talk <laughs> about. <laughs> so yes, please, please call me up when you've got some, some fun things to, even off the record, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I would love to do that. Perfect. All right. Well, now with now that my brain is is spinning with thinking about the future, uh, I I hope we get to talk more in the future. And as this progresses, or if we meet up at another conference, I would love to get you guys back on, especially as we get up to the release. Let's let's have a big launch party with you guys here live, and we'll awesome. we'll talk about Spiral <laughs> when when that's ready to go too. But Great. I think with that, we're we're good for today, and really appreciate you guys coming on. It's a really interesting topic, and I think it's going to be a fascinating one for people to listen to. So, thank yeah. you. Put thank spiral you so on your theme wish list. Yes, really yes, nice. and we'll have links in in all of the places for everybody. So yeah, awesome. all right, we will talk to you soon. Everything else. Bye. Yes. Later. Take care of yourselves. Take care. You too. This has been a new Overlords production. For more, please visit newoverlords.com for video, subscribe and feed links, and other ways to help the show.